God is in our midst, forming us to be God's own people. Though the way may be difficult, God will be with us. We need not fear. In the Lord we will take our refuge, for God is our strength. Come to the Lord, who will surround you with God's own righteousness. Lord, open our hearts and our spirits, so that we may faithfully follow you. Amen.
Dear Lord, we just thank you so much uh, for this community, for keeping us safe, for keeping us together um, during this difficult year and a half, Lord. And we continue to lift up our brothers and sisters in our prayers. Um, we lift up our sister, Jane Larson. And, um, we pray that your presence, your strength, will continue to be upon her. We pray for our sister, Clara and Henry. We pray that you continue to fill her her uh, days with joy and happiness, and we pray that, that her back will be healed. Lord, we pray for our sister Dorothy Michibashira, um, that she's getting help. Lord, we pray for a strong recovery and for her body to be you know, whole and complete, and for her to get all the help that she needs uh, to get a full recovery. Lord, we pray for Violet's son, Dale, who is diagnosed with lung cancer. We pray that he has all the help and support that he needs to, to beat this cancer, Lord. We pray for all the medical resources, and we pray for a real loving community to carry him during this hard time, Lord. We pray for Violet as she's having to see this from afar, Lord. We pray for strength and comfort for her. Lord, we pray for um, Jeanette, uh, or Ms. Mom. We pray for the different health issues that she's having. We pray for healing, we pray for strength. We pray for her to have all the help that she needs. Lord, we pray for Nan, um, Nan's sister Ruth, who's 95, Lord. We pray that uh, we open up our hearts, we receive her friends and her family, to receive help and aid, whatever she needs, in order for her to recover from her injury and you know, for her to just have a full, fulfilling life, Lord, during this time. We pray that you would open up her heart and continue to live her. Lord, uh, we come asking that um, you would help us as your church, as the body of Christ, and just as human beings, Lord, for us to come together to really battle this pandemic. Lord, we pray that, um, that more people will be able to shield themselves against this Delta variant, variant they would get vaccinated. Lord, we pray that we would come out of this understanding more about each other and leading more into you. We come with all of our different burdens and our concerns. We're so thankful that you hear us in our moments of powerlessness, in our moments of sadness, and you rejoice with us as well. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
do not my hand make unto all these things. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you are forever opposing the Holy Spirit, just as your ancestors used to do. Which of the prophets did your ancestors not persecute? They killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one. And now you have become his betrayers and murderers. You are the ones that received the law as ordained by angels, and yet you have not kept it. When they heard these things, they became enraged and ground their teeth at Stephen. But filled with the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears, and with a loud shout, all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he died. This is the word of God, the people of God. Thanks be to God. We'll now see, we'll stand, we'll now see. You know the more from faith. Please stand. <laughs> And it talked about how you could stand 
on a carton of eggs with your bare feet. Kids. Right? If you're a kid, most likely you can stand on uh, a dozen eggs on one, one foot and a dozen eggs on the other foot, and guess what? The eggs won't break. Can you guess why? Joey? Layers? Sort of. So I showed a picture. I actually wanted to bring eggs and somebody said but <laughs> and it got about last week. I didn't go so well. And uh, you know, wasting food and whatnot. We need the eggs after somebody said that. But anyways, so here's a picture. So basically each egg can hold about five pounds because of its arc. Right? So two cartons, two uh, dozen eggs can hold about 130 pounds. Right, so a kid can stand on two dozen eggs and it won't break because of the special arc of the egg. So it can withstand, you know, the weight. So I was thinking about this, you know, I think when we keep all of our Bible stories in our hearts, just like each and every single one of these eggs, right, it's like a little arc, right, in the eggs of our life, where when bad things happen, when hard times happen, when, when, when life seems to weigh us down, um, life can be really difficult at times, right? Especially during this pandemic. But for me, in my life, all my Bible stories are like my eggs that can carry the weight. You know, they're delicate, they're stronger than you think, and they help me go through really hard times. So I want all of you guys to remember, what are your favorite Bible stories? What do they teach you? What do they tell you about yourself? And whenever you have time, I really encourage all of you guys to read the Bible on your own. You know, they have different versions of the Bible, children's Bibles, so you can keep all of these stories in your heart, just like Stephen. Amen? Amen. 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 about who you are and where you came from 
and the, the story of your life, the story that you have of the world and where your life fits in. So she gives this example. There is a guy who is about to be a professional athlete, he gets into a car accident, and he's no longer able to be that professional athlete that he wants to be. So for a while, he's really sad, he's really depressed, because his life story said, your life was almost perfect, but now it's not. That was his life story. After a long time of rehabilitation and him finding joy and meaning in other areas, he looked back at his life before when he was just trying to be an athlete and thought, that's actually not a fulfilled life. So now his life story was, I didn't completely understand myself and I had these goals. Through this accident, I really realized who I am and the purpose and my, my life's purpose. See, his story about himself changed. And that story changing in his mind was a key part of him understanding his life and for him to feel fulfilled in his life. So this leads me to uh, our passage today. We are learning about Stephen. And Stephen is the first martyr of the church. So if you remember, our passage is kind of long. I didn't include the whole passage. Uh, but basically, Stephen in Acts chapter 6 is kind of like a deacon, right? This is the first time the word deacon is used in the New Testament. But there was a conflict between these two groups of widows. Um, there was the Hellenistic widows and the Judean widows, and they felt like the Hellenistic widows were not getting the treatment that they deserve. So this is, you know, so they said, you know, we really need to organize, we need to organize a way to make sure that the most vulnerable people in our society, which is at the time widows, um, are all getting fed. So they appoint Stephen, and he is in charge of distributing food to widows. Unfortunately, he's also a very powerful preacher, and people want to get rid of him. So they get false witnesses to create a story, kind of framing him, and they say, Stephen said that Jesus is going to come back and destroy the temple. So they drag him, and they bring him to the high priest. Now, at this point, I really believe Stephen knows what's going to happen because there is a distinct parallel between the accusation against Stephen and the accusation that happened against Jesus. So if we see here in Acts chapter 6, the accusation is, This man never stops saying things against the holy place and the law, for we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy the temple and will change the customs that Moses has handed to us. Right? So this is a false accusation. But look what happens, what happened in Matthew chapter 26, verses 59 to 65. Same thing. People brought false witnesses against Jesus, saying Jesus will destroy the temple in three days. He wasn't referring to the actual temple, he was referring to his body. But anyways, they rounded him up and they dragged him in front of the high priest. And we know we all know how that story ends. It's the same exact parallel. And Stephen knows the story. He knows what's going to happen. So as soon as the high priest challenges him, I really believe he knows that he is going to die. He's in his last moments. And so in his speech, he goes all the way back to the patriarch. So here he is, he's standing trial, uh, they kind of round him up, and he goes all the way back to the story of Abraham. And it's really interesting that here he is, staring death in the face, and he goes all the way back to the story of Abraham, he talks about Abraham and Joseph, and if you think about it, it's interesting because these are high priests. Nobody knows the Torah more than the people standing in front of him. It's like trying to explain the multiplication tables to like Stephen Hawking, right? It's very insult probably insulting to him. Uh, but here he is staring the high priest in the face, and he goes back and tells the story of the Torah. He, he says, you know, Abraham was our father, this was his life. Then he talks about Joseph, then he talks about Moses. And then in the way that he tells this whole story, he doesn't actually tell it the way that Genesis tells it. He tells it in a way that follows along with the rabbinic oral tradition. You see, back then, rabbis would continually tell the story about the Torah, but they wouldn't, you know, by verbatim, tell the whole story of Genesis, right? It's 50 chapters. But they had a way of, in the oral tradition, telling it in a way that was a rhythm, that made sense. 
that really drew people into the story. And the way he talks about Abraham follows the oral rabbinic tradition. The way a rabbi will tell the story of Abraham. Even the ordering of events is slightly different than what happens in Genesis because he's not actually explaining the way it is in Genesis in the Torah. He's explaining it the way a rabbi will tell the story. And then the way he talks about Moses, rabbinic tradition, separates the life of Moses into 40-year parts. So if you read his speech in Acts chapter 6, he goes in and he talks about Moses the first 40 years, the second 40 years, like a rabbi would tell somebody trying to teach a disciple. So really, in the way that he's telling the story, he's telling those that are accusing him and the religious establishment that he knows the scriptures just as much as any rabbi would that these stories have all been in his heart. But what's also interesting is he doesn't actually mention the name of Jesus once. He doesn't indict himself. He mentions the prophecy of a holy one or a messiah, but we all know how in the Old Testament a messiah was prophesied. He doesn't mention the name of Jesus once. All he does is he talks about the story of the Torah in the way a rabbi would. And then he says something very interesting. Um, he talks about how God looks for a home, you know, a place to rest. And then he says, a, a Messiah was prophesied, but the old prophets were killed. They weren't believed. And he's indirectly saying, in the same way that he didn't believe in Jesus. Well, this is just the straw that breaks the camel's back for everybody who's listening. You know, they are, they drag him out to the city, uh, they, they grab the stones, and Stephen says something. He says, I see the Son of Man sitting next to God. Oh, I see the Son of Man standing next to God. So as this is happening, the stones are raised up. He sees this vision of Jesus standing next to God. And as they're lifting the stones, just as Jesus said on the cross, Please forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And then he dies. He is a parallel to Jesus. His life is a parallel to Jesus in a sense. But what's also interesting, tying this again to the Old Testament, all throughout the Old Testament, that saying, the Son of Man sitting next to God, is all throughout the Old Testament. This is the first time that it's mentioned where the Son of Man is standing. Right? He's always sitting, never standing. But when Stephen looks up, he sees Jesus standing next to God. And it's almost like, you know, in his last moments, I don't know what he saw exactly, but he was seeing Jesus stand up and to receive him. And that's how he passed away. So there's so many parts about this story that come together that tie in with the Old Testament. But I think what's important to note is that everything ultimately when the stones of life, you know, were facing him, when his accusers were facing him, it all came back to Jesus, who Jesus was. And he knew the story. He knew the story of the Torah. He knew the story of the Bible. He knew where his life was placed in the story. And through Jesus, it all made sense. It all gave him a sense of purpose and understanding. And I believe that's why he was able to, at the last moments, face his opposition head on because of the story that was in his heart. You know, I think all of us come to times where the stones of life, you know, are uh, held up against us. You know, whatever that may be, where life seems unfair, where people are not nice, or things don't go the way that we want to. And it's in those moments, I believe, just like Stefan, we need to ask ourselves, what is the story that is in your heart? What is the story that you tell yourself about who you are, what your life's meaning, and the role your story plays in the greater picture? You know, I know that um, many of you know uh, Bob Nakata recently passed away. Uh, but he was a longtime pastor in the Windward side, longtime Methodist pastor. But he was also a pioneer of social justice issues. And he did so many things, you know, he was, he 
leader, he was a leader of so many different organizations. Um, he did so many things. He was a state legislator and then he was a, a state senator. And um, in 2018, a $200 million housing trust was put in his name, it's called the Bob Nakata Bill, to build affordable housing in Hawaii um, until the year 2030. So as you can imagine, uh, that's really a life fulfilled, I believe, right? When I think of Bob Nakata, um, we, we actually served right after him in Kahalu, uh, the United Methodist Church, just before he retired. Um, so he retired, he retired when my husband went to Kahalu UFC. So we got to know him, and we could really see his handprint all over the Windward side, especially in the Kahalu community. But I came across this interview uh, where he was interviewed by the Kukua Foundation, or the Kukua Oral History Project. If you search it, you can find it. Uh, but he talks about how, you know, when the Kahalu farmers were opposing big development in his area, um, you know, they all had different political ideologies and the reason why they were doing it. Uh, but he said, you know, as a Christian, it came down to who he believed Jesus was. And the quote said, I'm very deep into this Christianity. I saw Jesus as a real revolutionary and as a medium for a followers as his disciples. Right? So everything that he did really came down to who he believed Jesus was. And I think about this because I think all of us, in what we do and how we live, it comes down to our core stories. So recently, um, I decided to go for a run and I've been trying to you know, get back into exercising and whatnot. COVID was not good for my exercising routine. I don't think I've broken a sweat since 2019. <laughs> so I went to Alamon Beach Park, you know, I had my AirPods on. Um, and I kept thinking about the story of Stefan because the story of Stefan is actually, I think, a very sad story. And I remember as I was looking through the book of Acts, preparing for this series, um, and after this week we'll go back to the lectionary. This is the last, you know, Acts sermon. But I remember reading the story of Stephen and thinking, God, I will never preach on this passage. You know, because it's so tragic, it's so sad. Here's this young man helping people, he gets dragged out, you know, and he becomes the first church martyr. But when I went for that run, and I kept running, and I had all these things on my heart. You know, the school year starting again, and as I've shared before, I have two special needs daughters. And every time the school year starts, it's a kind of difficult time for me because I know that as my daughters are getting older, the difference between them and their peers gets bigger. Um, as I go through the school supply list, I see that you know a lot of the things that other kids are getting, like protractors and things that you know that other fourth graders might need. I know that my daughter might not be using those things. So it's always like a kind of emotional time for me. Then I started thinking about the pandemic. You know that this is. You know, we're still in this, and I remember this time last year, we were like, by July, we'll be home free, July 2021. So I think in my mind, I kind of put a star on the month of July, July 2021, this is me last year, thinking, you know, I just have to make it to July 2021. And here we are in triple digits in the hospital, and the hospitals are getting filled in July 2021. So I kind of felt, in, in, in a sense, you know, the stones of life were just rising up. And as I was going through this run, the story of Stephen kept coming into my heart and my mind. And I really felt God asking me, what is your story? What is the story that's in your heart? Why do you do what you do? What is the purpose of your life? And by the end of that run, I was in Alawana, and I was like, I'm so glad it's dark, because I'm like crying and running, it's not a good look. Uh, but I remember thinking, I want to be just like Stephen. I want my story to be wrapped up completely in the person of Jesus Christ. My conviction, my life's purpose, I want it all to come back to Jesus Christ. And believing that Jesus is a hope for this world. If we can live like Jesus, if we can understand the world that Jesus, the way that Jesus did, the world will be a better place, a more loving place. And I want Jesus to be the core of my story. Hope he's the core of all of our stories. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we just thank you for the story of Stephen, 
for his knowledge of scripture and the way that he just wrapped the whole Old Testament up in his heart and tied it to your son, Jesus Christ. We saw that he saw this vision of Jesus standing and receiving him. Lord, for me in my life, I hope to see you, to see Christ standing and receiving me one day because I knew my story. I knew the reason why I'm living. I knew the whole story and the role my life played in it. I pray for all of us, Lord, to all have our stories, to find belonging, transcendence, community, and the story that we tell about who we are as your people. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let us stand for our response.
If the COVID cases continue to rise and we feel that our in-person attendees of safety have been infected with all of you, then we will go back to online worship, but I'll keep everybody updated. So uh, I'm going to go get the supplies on Tuesday for Peolu Elementary School Supply Drive. If you haven't already, uh, please donate to this drive. Uh, they are uh, experiencing a lot of budget cuts. A lot of parents actually uh, are not able to bring the full supply list that the kids need uh, for the school year. So as we know, you know we get a long uh, supply list of things we need to get. Uh, but Keolu Elementary uh, has a consistent issue where parents are not able to supply all the supplies. So they'll bring partial some of it, and uh, but also the teachers are not getting extra funds. The extra funds they need to actually get the, the school ready. So they sent me a Google Charts of uh, all the things that the different teachers requested and I think we can more um, we can more than provide for the things that, that they requested. So please if you have not already, um, if you could donate on PayPal or write a check, please just put school supply line, uh, school supply drive in the memo line so we know where to where to put that. So I will go this Tuesday and we will deliver the supplies sometime this week uh, to to KO Elementary to the teachers. So we have a small vacation Bible school uh, that's going to be happening. It's going to be this Friday at 7 and um, on Saturday uh, at 10, so two days. Uh, it's not overnight. I'm going to go back home and come back. Uh, but we're going to try to keep everything really safe. It's going to be a combination of indoor, outdoor. But even indoor, we're going to have everything like this, open air. Everybody's going to be social distancing and wearing masks. Um, we're going to make it as safe as possible for our kids. Um, so we're going to play some games, some crafts, we got all of our crafts in, all of our activities in. It's going to be a really great time. And we're going to be learning the story about Joseph. Um, we're going to be walking through that story in this vacation Bible school. So um, please, if you have Kiki or grandchildren, please encourage them to come this Friday. We're continuing our Genesis Bible study every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Um, so actually, the first Wednesday, August 4th, the first Wednesday of August, we will not have Bible study because we have admin council meeting. Um, but I really looked at Genesis. It looks like this Bible study will have to go to the middle of December, because, uh, middle of, sorry, September, uh, because we have to take out two weeks for our admin council meeting in August and September. So we have UMW. Uh, that's the Saturday. It's at 10.30 to 11.30, and it's on Zoom. If anybody's interested in, in attending, um, please see this information, and I'll be including it in the newsletters uh, this week. So we're continuing to work on our online worship. Last night, I was here trying to figure out this program that I want to use, and I finally, as you can see from the picture, got it to connect from our Canon computer into my computer. It doesn't look like much, but it's really a miracle. Uh, but it worked only for like a minute, so now, now I'm trying to see what else I need to do. So we'll see. And today I actually forgot to put the transmitter on the, the iPhone, so the sound might not be as good as it was last week. Uh, but continuing to work on it, and hopefully by September we'll have a, a real flow and uh, system that works. And I have a great announcement. We received a thousand dollar grant for our online worship from the Hawaii district. I didn't actually ask for this grant. <laughs> See, I'm really happy. Um, so, a First United Methodist Church has a couple of grants and a scholarship, scholarship set aside um, in conjunction with DSD. They agreed to award Kayla Mana and that Methodist Church with this thousand dollar grant. Because, you know, all churches. You know, they've been, they've been putting, you know, a lot of funds into their both and worship, but we kind of have a, we're kind of working with a smaller budget. So it's, it's, all, it's all a matter of um, sticking with their budget. So they sent this to us uh, as a way to help us continue with this online worship. You know, we have you know, 20 some people here, maybe 30, and online it's been consistently um, the same or if not more people watching. So we always have to uh, keep our online members, you know, up to date, and we want them to have a great worship experience as well. That's all the announcements for today. At this point in time, we will be taking the offering. I will 
tonight goes to There is a bowl in the back table. You can place your offering in that bowl. Or for those of you that prefer to use PayPal, paypal.com is very easy to use. You may go to this bell for our offering prayer. Mighty and all-knowing God, who sees us as we are and as we might be, what offering can we give that we bring you joy? We have brought gifts this morning that you might dedicate them to the work of caring and compassion in our neighborhoods, in our nation, and throughout the world. This is the offering we dedicate this day. In Christ our Redeemer, we pray. Amen. Thank you. 